All right. Welcome, 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 everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Career Roundtable this lovely Friday morning. Um, so today we are going to talk about freelancing and the exciting Pangea app. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, I did want to kind of go over some uh, some things real quick just to kind of get you acquainted with the Career Center and all of our amazing resources that we have here. And then I will turn it over to Adam. Uh, so the Career Center, the Career Roundtable, um, we have been in production since 2019. Um, Vinod and I bring the Career Roundtable from foundations to all students of all different majors. Uh, the Career Roundtable is a forum for students to discuss and discover career opportunities in visual arts design, museum studies, art education, art history, and other fields that may or may not relate to art and design. Um, so we are, the main goal of the Career Roundtable is to provide first year students and beyond the opportunity to prepare for career possibilities and to connect with mentors. So we have brought in faculty, we have brought in staff, we brought in alumni, we brought in artists, industry experts to these roundtables. And we want to continue this because I do think it serves as a visualization for students as to what they can do in the future and with their major and all of their skill sets. So I'm um, just really excited about that. Uh, but a little bit about me. My name is Marcy Bishop Lilly. I graduated from a really small university in North Carolina, uh, the University of North Carolina at Pembroke with my bachelor's degree in art education. Um, from there, I, I uh, transferred here to UNT to pursue my MFA in painting and drawing. So um, I've been around, I've been an adjunct here for a while. Um, I have been in this role particularly for three years. Um, and I just really enjoy it because I get to advise students in creative career pathways. I get to research all these. You know, I am bringing in out Adam to this session to talk about freelancing. So for me, it's just really fun. Um, and I also lead in professional development events for CVAD students, um, building employer connections, and also collaborating with faculty. So a little bit about the Career Center. Um, if you need any assistance with the following, um, you know, services, we have resume, cover letter, website, portfolio, social media. Those are some of the things that I can help you with and assist you with. Um, so I know, you know, having a website as an artist um, or, you know, as an artist, a portfolio, website, social media, these are all really important things to kind of consider, especially promoting your digital presence. So if you need a second pair of eyes, we can always help you with some of these things here at the Career Center. Um, we do mock interviews, we can do professional headshots, um, we, do, we, we can help you with job search strategies, internships. Um, we also have a program called Mean Green Mentors in which um, students are paired with alumni who are currently working in the industry. So if you, you know, wanna reach out and connect with alumni, that would be a great opportunity. And also graduate school assistants. Um, I do meet with a lot of students who are interested in pursuing a graduate um, degree. And so we can definitely help you with some of those application materials, your CV, you know, um, getting your portfolio together. So those are things that we can help you with. Uh, I do have a QR code here. So if you scan that, you should be directed to navigate to be able to schedule that appointment with me. I also wanted to mention this is like hot off the press. We have an unpaid internship scholarship available. And um, so this is for students in all majors. If you acquire an internship that is unpaid, just so you know, there are resources out there for you to pursue so that you can continue in this internship and have some funds, okay? So there are a few requirements on that um, scholarship, like you must be enrolled as a UNT student, you must have uh, completed at least 30 plus UNT credit hours, um, international students must have work authorization for the internship to be eligible. Uh, and I do have a QR code here on the flyer. And if you kind of scroll across here, um, 
any words with underlined um, links you can click on and be sent directly to that web page for more information. But definitely check that out. Uh, the applications are due by Monday the 13th. So right now is a really great time for, you know, if you're a junior or a senior, but there's really no time that's too early to start looking for an internship. But if you're doing that research, you discover that this internship is unpaid, just know that there are resources out there to help you. I also wanted to, um, and I mentioned this in all of our career roundtables, but I did want to let all of our students know that I do post highlighted jobs for CVAD students on the CVAD News and Views webpage. So these are tailored specifically for our art students, our design students, and our education students. There are other few things um, in the line of events that I wanted to mention. Um, we have the UNT TWU Education Career Fair. If you've never been to uh, a career fair at any capacity, I would recommend going. It's really fun. There's a lot of energy. You get to network with employers. Um, some of the employers will have opportunities available, internships, full-time opportunities, part-time. So it's just really important to be seen. Um, come dress professionally, bring some copies of your resume if you would like to network. Um, but we have the education career fair and we also have the all majors career fair. And if you're ever curious about who the employers are um, that are going to be attending some of these events, you can always click on see more employers. So all of these events are listed in Handshake. So if you're familiar with Handshake, you know that this, this platform is what we use to post jobs, internships. We also do our events here. So any type of career center events are posted into Handshake as well. So if you tag that or if you save it, you should be getting notifications like, hey, you have uh, an event coming up. So, um, you know, feel free to come to these uh, career fairs. They are come and go. You don't have to stay like the full four hours, um, but just, you know, come and, and network and see what it's all about and just, you know, put yourself out there, get out there, talk to um, employers and people in the industry. Uh, but this career fair will be located in the Union 314 on April the 20th. So feel free to register for that. Uh, another thing that I would like to mention is that you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, I primarily use my LinkedIn account to promote any kind of events that we have going on um, that are specific to CVAD or College of Music. Um, so, you know, again, like any employers that are connecting with me, um, sending me opportunities, if they have flyers, I will post them there. Also, um, any of those jobs that I've shared with CVAD will also be shared on my LinkedIn. Um, so, you know, feel free to connect with me. So now I would like to introduce our presenter. All right, so welcome Adam. Adam is going to be talking about how to use freelancing to find and land jobs. Uh, and he is the CEO of the Pangea app. Okay, so um, really excited to talk about that. Adam is the co founder of Pangea app, a VC backed startup that helps students find paid, part time, remote work, freelancing. Starting at Brown University, Pangea is now used by students from more than 1,500 different colleges who have collectively earned more than 1 million, pretty impressive, through this platform. Adam was named one of the 25 under 25 in Rhode Island and has been featured in Inc. Magazine, Forbes, TechCrunch, and the Boston Globe. So welcome, Adam, and I'm going to uh, unmute you now. <laughs> Well, thank you, Marcy. Uh, for introduction. Um, what amazing resources that that you all provide at the Career Center. I wish that I had things like that when I was in college. I think that unpaid internship scholarship is phenomenal. And if I were here today, I would have totally have taken advantage of like those resume reviews and the social media reviews because I was a filmmaker, and oftentimes just getting a different perspective on things is super super helpful. 
And so much of what I've done over the last couple of years is like get other eyes on what I'm doing and get their feedback. So if you're not going to go see Mar, if you're not seeing Marcy, you're not getting feedback, uh, you're missing out on an incredible opportunity to do so. So go drop in and say hello. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, anyways, I really appreciate uh, all of you showing up today, giving me an opportunity to come and talk with you. Uh, my goal is to help you learn a lot in our brief period of time today. I want you to understand a little bit more about what's happening in the world of freelancing, kind of what that is. I know that when I was in college, I really didn't know what freelancing was and it felt very mysterious and even had a little bit of a stigma behind it. So I'm here to help clear that up, give a little context on myself, where we've come from, uh, give you some advice on freelancing. I'll talk a little bit about how our product works at the end. And then I'd love to open it up into a bit more of a conversation and 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 be a sounding board for you in terms of answering questions um, or being helpful in any way that I can. So without further ado, I did put together a little presentation. So we could probably share that and that'll give us a nice little guide as we as we navigate through here. So let me, uh, let me do that. Alrighty. I titled today's talk, The Intro to Freelancing, kind of like Freelancing 101. Um, and I'm here to help you find work, make money, and exceed expectations at today's UNT Career Roundtable. So a bit of background on how I got to where I am today. I was lucky enough when I was in sixth grade to find something I was passionate about. I know sixth grade was a long time ago, um, but my parents got me a video camera for my birthday. And I just remember the moment of unwrapping it and just how thrilled I was by it. And it ignited this little spark, this little interest that grew into this little flame, this little hobby that became my passion and what I thought would become my life's purpose throughout high school. Uh, my interest in, in videography, you know, I was posting stuff on YouTube. I was the founder of my high school's filmmaking club. Uh, I got a video that got a million views. Uh, so I was really excited by the opportunity of creating things and making things. And it didn't really matter to me in that moment in time whether or not it really led to a particular career. But my portfolio and kind of the body of work and the things I had done in terms of founding clubs uh, led me to, to Brown University, which is where I started in 2013. I graduated in 2017. Um, I, was a, I was a history major. So kind of Brown doesn't have an art school so much, but I was liberal arts. So I was doing a lot of videography um, in classroom, outside of classroom, and then doing a lot of reading and writing in terms of history, studying how documentaries are being used today uh, to help construct and tell history, which I thought was a really fascinating trend. And I found myself mildly stuck between these, you know, mostly unpaid internships um, and campus jobs. And it felt like there were two ends of a spectrum of one thing was going to help me build experience and one thing was going to help me get paid. Um, but I was trying to find a way to, to basically make money, do what I was passionate about and find some kind of path forward, both personally and professionally. Um, so while I was struggling, I wanted to take control, do work that made an impact uh, and find some money while, while doing it. Um, so in doing so, I ended up trying to solve my own problem. And that's what led me to found Pangea.app, which has become the, the US's, the country's, the world's uh, largest college freelance platform. And we'll kind of return a little bit later about how the platform works and how it might be helpful to you. Uh, it's been used by more than 25,000 students now, more than 1,800 campuses, um, who collectively have earned uh, more than a million dollars on our platform over the last 18 months. And I'm really, really proud of that. So we're a platform where students can find part-time, remote work in tech, um, in roles ranging from marketing to design to engineering and everything in between. So uh, all of you here today, I'm sure can find an opportunity on Pangea that, that relates to you. So stepping back a little bit, I wanna talk a little bit about freelancing and a little bit of history around why I think it's a really exciting opportunity today. So as a history major, let's talk a little bit about history. So this is a little bit of what I imagine work was like 20 years ago. I mean, it's a pretty beautiful office, um, but it used to be that work was going to an office and being there nine to five. 
Um, and, you know, many people work that way. I still, you know, I show up to the office and I have working hours. Um, but that used to be like the only way that work happened. It happened in person, in an office, nine to five. And as a result, internships tended to, to reflect that reality. They happened in person and they happened at a time in which you could actually, when you were in school, could go somewhere and be in an office. And this was in the summer. So summer internships reflected the way the working world operated. Um, and a lot of them were centered around training and the potential of growing into full-time jobs. But as a result of the highly structured nature and the, the intention behind them, they tended to be more available for rising seniors or rising juniors. So if you were a first year student or a second year student, it was really hard to get an internship because the notion of joining that company full time was so far down the road that companies didn't want to spend the time training you uh, because it was rather unlikely that you were going to end up there full time. Um, and also as a result, a rather limited set of companies were actually offering internships, namely, namely like the Fortune 500 or the Fortune 1000. So large enterprises, thousands of employees um, tended to be the ones that were hosting these internships. But something that's been really interesting and a trend that's you know really picked up in the last several years is the number of people moving away from traditional employment you know sitting in office and work hours and being what's called a w-2 employee um and the, the rise of freelancing um in the last seven years the number of folks freelancing in the united states um has grown to more than 59 million people in the u.s and it's expected that uh, more than 50% of the entire US workforce is actually trending towards freelancing either as a full time job or in addition to what they do as a full time job and companies have started hiring more of these freelancers because they can bring in more specialized people who can have a bigger impact more immediately um, and kind of flex in and flex out. Um, so it's a really interesting trend, and we see this as an opportunity for students to find a new way to build experience, make money and work with companies who haven't traditionally had internship programs. So what is freelancing and what are all these people actually doing? Well, being a freelancer is basically like being a business of one, uh, also interchangeably known as an independent contractor. So it's like having your own business without all the complex paperwork of having to incorporate and you know have all these regulations that you would typically have when starting a company. Um, some of the distinct differences between being a freelancer versus being an intern or employee is who used to be your employer is now your client. Uh, you're basically providing them a service um, and they're basically your customer. Um, and I think that's a really helpful framework for using in terms of building good relationships. And we'll come back to that um, later in this talk. But as a freelancer, you're going to have a lot more control over your rates and your payment structure. Uh, you can get paid hourly, you can get paid per projects. Uh, you can also get paid like monthly retainers uh, to provide a bit more stability and predictability around what you're going to earn. You generally have a lot more flexibility in terms of your hours, right? So by definition, as an independent contractor, you have flexibility in terms of when you work and how you do your work. Now, you might have several meetings a week where you need to be somewhere at a particular point in time, but generally you're not going into an office between a set time frame. Uh, you can be doing the work in between your classes, in the evenings, on the weekends, and you can really fit it into your structure and your schedule as a student, which is one of the reasons why we see a lot of students loving this kind of work. And finally, it's mostly remote. So while you might be um, in North Texas right now, uh, you can find opportunities out here on the East Coast, which is where I'm calling you from today, on the West Coast and everywhere in between. So uh, the world of remote work has really opened up a lot of opportunities for you. And we saw this you know, during the pandemic where a lot of the traditional internships went remote as well. And it proved that a lot of the kind of work that was happening in this world can be done remotely. Uh, and, and all the opportunities in our platform tend to be remote. So that's a little bit of what freelancing is. And I think one of the really exciting things is that Gen Z, our generation, is actually adopting freelancing faster than any of the previous generations. Um, it's estimated that more than 50% of Gen Z freelance in some capacity. And when you look at all the folks on TikTok, all the influencers making money, guess what? They're all freelancers. 
they're all running their own micro businesses and setting their own rates and finding their own clients. So I think there's a lot of really exciting opportunities for you in freelancing, very broadly speaking. Um, and again, it's provided a new opportunity for students, uh, a new pathway for building experience. And as a result, that's why we're adopting it faster than any other generation. We're on the cutting edge of, of the next big thing. So again, what is freelancing and what are some examples of it? It's flexible paid work that can get done remotely. That's what I, we like to talk about it. When we hear, hear freelancing, it sounds like a big, scary word, um, but really it's any work that's flexible, paid, and you can do remotely. If it's flexible, paid, and you can do remotely, it's freelancing. Um, some examples of popular freelancing opportunities that we've helped students get on our platform, uh, part-time social media management. So creating social media graphics, creating content, uh, reaching out to influencers for partnerships, res responding and engaging to folks um, in the DMs is actually the most popular um, engagement on our platform. It's one of those things that companies want to work with Gen Z on, and it's one of the things that we're, we're exposed to on a near daily basis, unfortunately. Um, and being a social media, social media manager on average on our platform is helping students earn around $150 a week. So imagine having an extra $150 in your week, some more funds, uh, I like that term, in your pocket as you go into the weekend. Um, another example is building a website for a company. So this might be uh, a smaller startup, smaller brand. They need a website redone. It's been a very popular need. Uh, you don't need to know how to code necessarily. There's a lot of new platforms in Wix and Squarespace and Webflow that make it really easy to basically design and build websites, even if you're not an engineer. Um, and I'd say $500 on the lower end. We've had companies pay to thousands of dollars for help building a website. Um, third, and there might be some designers on this on this call, but UI and UX uh, for web apps, for mobile apps, we have a lot of early stage entrepreneurs who are trying to build prototypes of really cool products. And this is an oftentimes an ongoing role, making twenty to thirty dollars an hour. And then another example of a popular one is blog writing. So researching a topic, writing blogs of around five hundred words each that you know contain certain words and images and links to different places um, has been a very popular ongoing role. In fact, our entire blog at Pangea is, is written by, by Pangeans who we hired on our platform. So some really interesting opportunities here. And again, because so much of this work, these examples are focused on immediate value for the clients, a whole new category of companies are turning to it as a way of working with emerging talents. Um, which is kind of the broad term for college talent, folks that are early in their career. And the types of companies that are using our platform to hire are early stage tech companies, companies that have maybe raised a million or two or three million or not quite yet, or a bit more than that. Um, who are working on really cool, interesting problems, emerging brands. So e-commerce companies that are really cool and doing really interesting things. And then digital agencies as well. Um, are some of our most popular types of companies that use our product who might not be having, you know, might, are definitely not hiring 100 interns at a time. And it can be very hard to work with them if they have that structure. Uh, who is freelancing for? By the way, if you have any questions as I go through here, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, I'm gonna try to, I have a lot of content to get through. I'm gonna try to speak slowly. It's okay if you don't digest all of it. If you have questions on any of it, Drop it in the chat and I'm going to make sure that we have plenty of time uh, to turn this into a bit more of a conversation so I can turn off my professor hat and, and, and just be one of y'all. So who is freelancing for? It's really for students of any major, any year, including recent grads and including first years. Um, it's a way for folks who want to apply their skills and need an income. Everything on our platform is paid. Um, engagements are flexible to anything from, you know, one or two hours a week, if maybe you're just producing a blog, up to more full-time engagements. Most of the engagements tend to be around 10 hours a week. Um, so something that you should be able to fit into your schedule if you're doing an hour or two a day. And the average hourly rate on our platform is $22 an hour. So these are, these are, these are good paying opportunities. So freelancing compared to internships, and then we'll jump into basically how to get into freelancing. Uh, they're more independent than internships or working with smaller companies. They have a little bit less structure. Um, so there's a bit more of an onus on you to really take control of it. So if you're an independent person, freelancing is a great option for you. 
Um, if you need a little bit of mentorship and coaching, uh, you can get that as well, but you need to kind of ask for it. Um, and then they're year round, very flexible in terms of hours. So you're not limited to, you know, um, I'm not really sure what the summer break schedule is in for in, in UNT, but you know, you're not limited to June and August um, to find your opportunities. You can find these throughout the school year and they can oftentimes be a replacement for a more like part-time job. So that you're adding things to your resume that can help you the next summer get a larger internship or get a full-time job when you graduate. And again, uh, a little bit more what I like to call self-leadership. So you taking control and taking the initiative and a bit more responsibility um, and higher expectations. So I, I just like to be transparent about what makes freelancing a little bit different than an internship. Um, it's not perfect for every single individual in their journey, um, but if you are independent and you do pride yourself on taking initiative and taking responsibility, uh, freelancing is a great opportunity for you. Um, I never liked working with authority, um, so I gravitated towards this very quickly as a way that I could kind of like take more control over what I did. It's a different mindset. So let's jump into, you know, you understand what freelancing is, you see how it's growing in society, how it's a little bit different than internships and the types of things that you can do with freelancing. Let's jump into how you can actually secure a client. Um, so the next bunch of slides are, are, are certainly not Pangea specific. I tried to structure them to be um, educational regardless of what your path might be. And even if you do get a more traditional internship, um, I think that a lot of the content over these next couple slides are very applicable. Um, and if you get an internship and you take this knowledge into said internship, I think you're going to really exceed expectations. Uh, and that's my hope for you today. Um, so let's get into it. So I think it's helpful to start with a kind of a marketing one on one concept. And I try to apply kind of my lessons I've learned at Pangea to share with you on your own independent journeys. So some of you might already know these terms, but if you don't, um, marketing, I break into two camps, uh, outbound marketing and inbound marketing. Um, simply put, outbound marketing is when you go out and you find clients. Inbound marketing is when your clients come into you, they find you, they send you direct, you know, um, an email, right? So you can think about if I were a TikTok creator, as an example, and I had like my email in my bio, and I wanted to work with that person, me emailing that person would be that content creator basically getting inbound from me. So some examples of this are basically outbound. I like to think about applying to jobs as being a, a form of outbound marketing. Um, or even just cold outreach to companies and potential clients and employers. That's outbound marketing. Inbound marketing is basically you're invited to work, um, invited into an interview. Uh, at least that's how it works within Pangea. So maybe you've done such a great job that companies are actively trying to recruit you. Generally, it's a lot harder to get to inbound marketing. Um, and we tend to start with outbound marketing. So outbound marketing. I like to, to, to talk a little bit about sales funnels and marketing funnels and user journeys here. So a, a common framework when developing a sales process at a company and a marketing process at a company is to think about your, your end users or your potential customers as being in one of three phases. So there's the awareness phase, the consideration phase, and the decision phase. So awareness is how do they even know about you to begin with? How are they aware that you exist in the world? Consideration is how do they learn about you? How do they know that you might be a good fit? How do you compare with other folks or other options? And the decision is actually making a decision to hire you, use your product, um, sign up for your service. So I think a nice metaphor for this in terms of this context is thinking about how you apply to work how you interview for work, and then what happens once that decision happens um, and get hired. So I'm going to go through the next couple of slides within this framework of basically building awareness amongst potential clients, um, how they might consider you and how to best position yourselves in an interview um, and give yourself a, the best possible chance of basically having to make a decision to hire you. And then I'll even go a step beyond that of what happens once they hire you in terms of making sure that you deliver a great experience um, and you make them happy and talk about how to set expectations and what's expected of you and how to exceed those. 
So applying, interview, getting hired, and then what happens immediately after that. So let's start with awareness. And, and I think this goes across applications, whether you're applying on Handshake to an internship, um, a part-time job, or also just on Pangea to your freelance engagement. A couple points here. So the, the Greeks, and I, th I believe it was Aristotle, said there are three key pillars you need in any good argument. Um, you need logos, you need ethos, and you need pathos. What do these mean? Um, authority, basically what gives you the right, what gives you the legitimacy to basically have a grounds to, to say what you're saying. Um, does it make sense what you're saying? Is it rational? And then uh, why do I care? Um, what's the emotional kind of evocation? So when I write all my sales emails, right, when I reach out to potential customers to come and work with Pangea, I try to have all three of these, right? So authority is about trust, right? So who am I, right? Well, I'm the co-founder of a company that's raised some money and we've been successful and here's a news article. And I kind of lean on those types of things, right? Just as Mary introduced me to help me establish like authority on a subject matter, right? So <laughs> then you actually believe what I'm saying. So as a student, you might have uh, a degree in a certain program. Uh, you might have received certain awards. Um, maybe you have some portfolio pieces, you something you can share. Those are the things I kind of group into um, uh, the logos. Um, the logic is like, can I draw on some, because it makes sense, right? So my logic in today's kind of argument was more so look at the numbers. 40% uh, of Gen Z are freelancing and freelancing is growing. And it's kind of more of that like quantitative, okay, I'm looking at data. It's backing up this notion that freelancing is cool. And then the emotion was a bit more of my personal story. Right. So the personal story was me in sixth grade, me finding my passion, me struggling as a student and trying to figure out where I fit in the world. So you can see how if you're all still here, which I believe all of you are, um, I tried to weave all three of those things in before we really got started. So you can think about when you write applications to jobs or on your resume and your LinkedIn, trying to hit on those three things. Um, now, having all three things doesn't mean it needs to be super long. In fact, I believe that strong does not mean long. I will never write an email that has more than five sentences in it. And in five sentences, you can get all three of these things across if you're succinct and to the point and you know what they are. It's not, not always super easy. So um, do not send you know, a three page cover letter, five paragraph essay. Unfortunately, the folks you're trying to have read that just don't have the time to read it. And if they don't read it, they're not gonna get the value out of it. So you need to get the point across very quickly, something that I definitely know that the awesome team at the Career Center can help you out with these kind of things. Um, and then thirdly here, try to make it personal, right? So maybe the emotion is tying a little bit to the mission of the company or the opportunity in the role. It isn't just a generic, um, you know, I want to be a social media marketer for your company because I'm a Gen Z and I know, and I spend all day on Instagram. That isn't really personal. Uh, and that also isn't really unique. And then the last piece here is just no spelling errors. It takes so, I mean, all of us, I remember one of the things I wish I had learned when I was 20 was, you know, I get so excited and I want to send it and I don't take, I spend all the time writing it. I don't take the two minutes it takes to just reread it, um, and just make sure that I don't have spelling errors. Uh, I can't tell you how many applications I've received where in the first three words of the application, um, there's a spelling error. The capitalization isn't correct, the grammar isn't right, um, and it shows uh, a lack of care. And it's like, if you don't care about this, you know, just making sure that this is good work, why do I trust you to do good work um, and basically, you know, not make mistakes when you're here, if you can't just do it for two minutes right here. So that first impression really, really matters. Um, and it's, you don't, I don't want you to get passed over because you like had a lowercase I as the first word. Um, so use products like Grammarly. Um, it's a free product that is a Chrome plugin and it will check your grammar and spelling for you on the fly. Um, there's no excuses these days to have spelling errors. Um, good application. So about kind of building that authority and that rationality, use data where you can, right? People love numbers, right? We live in a big data world. 
So if you basically were like a president of a club and hosted events, try to include like how many people were in that club or what percentage engagement you did or how many events you put on or how much money you raised for a fundraiser, right? There's a lot of opportunities for you as a student to get involved on campus or in projects where you can try to get some kind of quantitative measure of impact. Um, because if you can tell me, hey, I launched a TikTok account and I got a million followers, then it's obvious to me that you know how to build a TikTok following. Um, and it's hard to argue with that. And that's the kind of stuff that me as a client or as an employer um, gets excited about. And it's, it's hard to argue against. So we love numbers. You should love numbers too. Try to make the next step clear and easy. So having a call to action is really important. Do you have time next week to hop on a 15 minute, you know, introductory call so I can learn more about the role? Um, you can include a link to your Calendly. Say, let me, let me know a time that works for you. And if you're not using Google Calendar or some kind of online calendar, there's a lot of free tool, you should. And there's a lot of free tools where people can automatically schedule time with you. Um, and these have been really helpful for me in my own life, but making it really easy for the end recipients of your communication to take that next step and basically removing friction from that employer, that client to basically, hey, this person, they have a great application. They understand what we're doing quick to the point, no spelling errors. I would love to talk to this person and like in two clicks, they can set up a call with you. Um, so make the next step clear and easy. Um, definitely be respectful here. Um, so say, let me know what time that works well for you or feel free to book a time in my calendar. Um, so don't necessarily force people into one call to action generally because they're the ones who are giving you an opportunity. Um, so it's, it's a matter of respect. Uh, and then the third thing here is, you know, if you can try to include a work sample um, or some link to something that you've done. And I'll come back to this a little bit more about even if you don't have a portfolio already, how you can generate something for that application uh, to basically give you a work sample. But that's what a lot of clients these days want to see because you're early, a lot of you are probably first, gen, first, first year students or freshmen or just in college in general, we don't have a big history of work experience. We don't have a LinkedIn that has 15 years of accomplishments. So the biggest concern that clients and employers have is how do I know this person's going to be good? And that's the big question that you need to answer uh, for anyone you're interacting with. You might hire you for an internship or hire you for freelance roles. You want to convince them that you're going to do a good job and displaying some type of sample, some kind of evidence of work that you've done is going to be one of the most helpful things you can do to establish that and make it easy for them to build confidence and conviction in you as an individual. Um, again, as a history major, a good history paper, you have a thesis and then your entire paper is evidence to support that thesis, right? So your thesis here is hire me because I'm going to be great. And then you need to think about layering in the right kind of argument of why you're going to be great and making that clear and convincing. And a work sample can be very helpful and data can be very helpful in that journey. All right. So those are my tips for running a great proposal. Um, you have all the things of the argument, it's short, it's at a point, clear CTA. Now let's talk about how to stand out. So you got yourself basically to an interview. Let's talk about what should be top of mind for you in this process. First of all, show up on time, camera on, smiling, and be prepared with questions. These are things that are, I call them requisites. If you don't do these things, it's going to be hard for you to move down the funnel. Um, Showing up on time is one of the things that anybody can do. One of the best pieces of advice that I ever received or one of the best insights I ever heard was it's really impossible to be on time when you think about it, right? It's like this instantaneous point that comes down to a second and you're either like a millisecond early or a millisecond late. Like you're never gonna be right on time. So you can think of yourself as being, you're either gonna be early or you're gonna be late. You gotta pick one. So either you're going to be five seconds early or five seconds late and always be early um, because if you show up five minutes late, it's a poor reflection on your time management. And also it indicates to me that you don't take this seriously or it's not a priority for you. Now things happen. Sometimes your, your schedule gets out of whack or your car breaks down, but we all have phones. 
I'll say that I think all of us have phones or we're with a friend who has a phone and there's a means to get in touch with the person you've been meeting with. And if you're going to be late, you can email them and let them know you're going to be late. But you basically get one pass. Um, if it becomes a pattern, it's bad. Um, so show up on time, show up smiling. If you have an important interview on a day, give yourself buffer time before that. So you make sure you're in a good environment with a good background, with good audio. Um, set yourself up for success. Um, don't kind of fill up that day. Um, I'll give you plus 10 points if you come to that interview with some ideas of kind of what you would be taking on in terms of projects. It demonstrates initiative. Um, and it's just a really great way to stand out. And I'll, I'll give you an example of that in just a moment. And again, your goal here during the consideration stage is to build conviction. You want this client or this employer to basically feel that you're the one. You're the one that's gonna solve their problem. You're gonna be a good fit for their team and they have confidence that you're gonna do a great job. So I wanna to talk to, I wanna show you like one of the, the best things that someone did when I was a client, and this is a, a, a current Pangean um, who asked for time to chat with me about a way that they might help me grow. I didn't even have a job option open. And she was like, I'd love to talk with you and see if there's any opportunity to help you out with social media and your LinkedIn. And I was like, sure, that seems like something I'm not focusing on that could be helpful. So Carissa here, who goes to University of College London, um, came to the call without prompted. Uh, she had looked at my LinkedIn profile or my social media profile as an example. And uh, she used Figma, but there's a lot of free design software. She basically just took a stab at rewording and redesigning um, a bit of my profile, right? So if you're applying for a marketing position, you might basically come up with like an idea for a poster um, and, and things of that nature. I'll jump in a little bit closer here. So literally what she did is she looked at my profile and she said, this thing I changed, this thing I changed, and there's five different things on here she changed. She has a little like postcard on there of the analysis. And I, it probably, this couldn't have taken her more than an hour um, to put together. But I was so impressed and so wowed. And what she did with this is she showed me that like she was gonna be a good fit for me. She basically did an example task for me without me asking and it helped build conviction. And I basically hired her on the spot. And this is something that she didn't have a portfolio of work. I didn't ask to see, hey, well, what have you done for other clients? She just showed me what she could do for me. And that was all I needed to see. So even someone without a portfolio who hadn't had an internship or a job before, I mean, she clearly is a very smart person um, and was able to deliver high quality work, right? And maybe that's the result of having opportunities before, but all of you are capable of learning things and producing high quality work without having had a previous work experience, right? Or having someone take a bet on you, you can take a bet on yourself. And that's what she did. She came to the interview with this ready. It took her two minutes to run through. And I can tell you that no one else has ever done that. And um, I was really excited to bring on the team. I felt very lucky. And that's something that everyone can do. Um, so some questions to ask while you're on these interviews, because again, there is always a question to ask and you should always come prepared because it indicates that you're interested and that like you, it's, there's an opportunity in there to show that you actually know what you're talking about and to help prove that you're going to be a good hire here. So, and again, if, if you're not interested in me as a client or employer, why am I going to be interested in working with you? It's a two-way street, right? It's like when you're walking around campus, you'll notice the, the level of energy and excitement by which you say hello to your friends or people that you know, they're going to greet you at that same level of interest and energy back. So if I say hi to someone, they're generally going to say hi. If I say, hey, they're going to give me a smile as well. Um, so you can think about that psychology in these calls. So first question I always like to ask is, what are the goals? What are you trying to strive for? So you're hiring someone to help you out with graphic design or marketing, you know, but what are the company's goals? Like, how does this role fit into the bigger picture in the short term and the long term? It's really helpful um, to ask this question because it shows that you care about the business's success. And it also helps you understand how to approach your role in a way that helps them towards that goal. Because at the end of the day, they're going to make a hire and every hire they're going to make is in some way going to impact to that company hitting their goals. So you want to make sure that what you're doing is actually helping the business strive towards that. Second, um, who in the company am I going to be working with most? Oftentimes, and particularly with like internship interviews, the person you're interviewing with is not going to be the person who's your manager or the team that you're working really closely with. 
So it's really good to ask this question also with a client because it sets up like the next phone call of like, oh, you know, you've been working really closely with our other product designer, Ty. It's like, great. Then you can write down that, not, that name and basically as a follow-up, be like, I'd really love to chat with Ty and learn more about them and see kind of what they're looking for. It gives you a great next step as oftentimes that is the next interview. The first interview is kind of a screening and the next interview is with the person that you're going to be working more closely with. Uh, when are you trying to have this person start? So getting a sense of their timeline, right? One of the biggest things we hear from students um, in general is like not having a lot of transparency in terms of the client or the company in terms of when they're trying to hire and feeling like they're in limbo in terms of an interview and they don't know when they're gonna hear back. So great to ask this when they're on the call to get a sense of their urgency. And if they're trying to hire someone ASAP and they like you, they're going to basically be moving quickly to, to get you in. Um, and then this is another good question that that again relates to what I was talking before is is there any intern is there any mentorship or do I have full independence and trying to get a gauge from them are of, are they trying to bring someone in that they want to coach and mentor to do things kind of their way and are you going to be supported in that way or do they want someone who's going to be more independent um, and kind of take a bit more driving seat um, it's a great way because it helps you understand how to approach the the, the opportunity. Um, and gives you a sense of if they want some of full creative control, but you don't feel like you're ready to do that, you can be like, I don't know if I'm going to be a good fit. Um, or if they're going to give, if they're going to be like really coaching you and you have your way of doing things, it's a good way to also know it's not a good fit for you. Um, so getting hired, just some, some, some big topics here. Um, on Pangea, it takes an average of applying to 20 opportunities to get hired. So a good corollary for this is when I reach out to companies to come to Pangea to hire, do you think I hit up, I email one company or two companies or three companies and say, hey, do you want to use Pangea to hire students? And if I don't hear back from them and I wait for those three companies to get back to me and um, if none of them do, I, I quit? No, I've, I've emailed tens of thousands of companies um, to come on Pangea to work and we've got more than 3,000 to sign up. Um, but you're not going to hear back from every single one. Same thing with when I raised our, our $3 million in investment. Uh, to raise our most, most recent fundraising round, do you think I hit up one or two or three investors um, and I was just putting all of my eggs in those baskets? Oh my God, if I had done that, I wouldn't be here today. I had to talk to 100 investors to raise the money. 50 of them never really took a call with me or never got back to me after the call. 30 of them maybe slow faded me or kind of ghosted me or gave me kind of like not a great reason. 10 of them didn't invest, but they gave me great feedback. And then 10 of them invested. So the same goes for you all. I think where I see a lot of folks go wrong is they apply to one, two, three jobs. They wait to hear back. Uh, and if they don't hear back, they get demoralized and they give up after, you know, I understand, you know, applying to 10 things um, is demoralizing, but don't let it get to you. Uh, on Pangea, it takes an average of 20 applications to get hired. And I've heard of people applying on LinkedIn to hundreds of jobs. Um, you're just not going to hear back from every single one. And you need to, it's a, it's a little bit of a numbers game. I've also heard stories of people just with a great profile applying to the right job at the right time with the right proposal. And they applied to one job and got hired. So it happens, but it is much more rare. Um, so you should think about basically the cost of inputs with the output. So this is a bit more of like a business theme, um, but I think you can all grasp it, all very smart. Um, so you wanna compare basically the costs of like getting a job with the output. So in, in business, this is called the lifetime value of a customer compared to the cost of acquiring customer. So a lot of businesses that fail basically spend too much money to acquire a customer. Right, so when I'm going at companies, I'm always thinking about how much money am I spending marketing and how much am I getting back. But I'm definitely spending more than zero dollars in marketing. So when you think about if I'm going to land a client, and if that contract, if I'm going to make five grand on that product, right, you can afford to basically pay. I put pay in quotes because you're not going to be paying money necessarily. Um, five hundred dollars to land it, right. So for you all, this might just be an input of time. Right, so if your hour is worth twenty dollars an hour, as an example, um, this might say it's going to take me twenty-five hours of work to get the job. 
But if I get the job and I get the right kind of contract and I put in the effort to learn and, and set it up to get that five grand, um, I'm going to end up making a profit on it, basically, because your costs are 500, but your revenue is five grand. Um, so I think it's a really helpful input because I think that we oftentimes don't think about, you know, you're going to get out what you put in. Um, so I like to include this because, again, as an entrepreneur, you're a business in a way. Um, so you should be thinking about your business in the same way. And when I showed you Carissa's example, you might think about, OK, if I have to send 20 applications, right, I might spend don't spend an hour on a cover letter for each one, spend an hour on like a sample portfolio piece for each one. And if you do that for 20 different clients, one of them's going to hire you. And you're and if anything, you can ask for feedback on it so that each one gets better and better and better and better and better. Um, and then you have a portfolio of 20 different things you made. Let's talk about exceeding expectations. Um, I want to talk about this just for, for a moment here. Uh, about why I put exceeding expectations and a little bit of my own personal history with that. So I'm sure a lot of you have like driven in an Uber before or a Lyft or stayed in an Airbnb or food on Uber Eats or Grubhub or DoorDash, whatever it might be, right? And all of these systems basically operate off of a five out of like five star system. You know, I don't know about y'all, but I think that most people I, I, I talk with, you know, if, if my Uber comes and it picks me up and the car is clean and it gets me to where I need to go on time, I'm giving that driver a five star. But isn't that what you expect? Isn't that kind of like the bare minimum? You know, if that driver shows up late or makes a wrong turn and, and gets me there a couple minutes late, and you know, I might give them a four out of five stars or a three out of five stars, right? Like a three out of five is not neutral. A three out of five is like not a good rating. Um, so the interesting thing is we've gotten locked into like, one to five stars, but five out of five stars is really just what we all expect. So when you're thinking about delivering, you know, an, an experience with with your employer or clients, I don't want you to think about, you know, five out of five stars, right? That's that's just what we all expect nowadays. I want to think about what a six out of five experience is, right? So let's say that Uber comes and picks you up, right? You get in the back of that car um, and there's like an iPhone charger in there. It's like, oh, that's really nice. You know, I wasn't expecting that and went a little bit above and beyond. Six out of six out of five. Let's say you come back again that same car, and not only is there an iPhone cable, but there's like a there's like a, a Fiji water in there and a little little bowl filled with you know Starburst, and all the Starbursts are pink because those are the best ones. Uh, oh man, you know, and I got the iPhone charger. Seven out of seven out of five. Let's say they come back around and uh, they pick you up, and it's not just like a Toyota Camry or an Acura or you know a solid car, but they pick you up in like a Ferrari. Oh man, that's pretty cool. I'm going to give that an eight out of five stars. Well, let's say they swing back around, they pick you up in a helicopter. And not, it keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going. And um, the co founder of Airbnb gives a great talk about this about going all the way to like 11 out of five stars, uh, where like 11 out of five is like you walk out of your house and like Elon Musk is there and he's got a rocket ship and he says, We're going to the moon. Um, you know, that's like, you know, never going to happen. But you see what I mean, where there's always an opportunity to exceed expectations. And Large Fortune 500 companies, when they do their internal reviews, they don't, they actually don't do a five out of five. They don't rate you on one to five. They actually rate you um, out of three, where the middle, the neutral, is meeting expectations. Below that, you need improvement. And above that, you exceed expectations. And if you want to move up in the corporate world, you always want to strive to exceed expectations, not just meet them. And meeting is, meeting is neutral. So if you don't meet them, you're actually needing an improvement. And that's like more negative. So like asking for extensions or like not delivering the right thing, that's like negative territory. Beating deadlines, putting in a little extra work, like beating it by an inch, you wanna be kind of on that end of the scale. So think about delivering six out of five experiences with your colleagues, with everyone you interact with always. So exceeding expectations. I wanna give you some tips on how to do that particularly as it relates to that third piece there. So we covered awareness, we covered consideration. Let's talk about getting hired, right? So let's say you're hired. Now it's all about getting onboarded, right? So a lot of, this is honestly where a lot of companies go wrong. They think that the entire recruiting game is all around like recruiting and making the hire. And where a lot of companies go wrong is what happens after that. 
Um, so this happens at a lot of businesses. Again, the Fortune 500s know this better than other companies, but uh, smaller companies basically think that once they make the hire, their work is done and that you're just gonna show up and start doing stuff. But that's not really how the world works. There's a process of getting up to speed. So we like to focus, we like to break down onboarding into two steps, um, getting oriented and then getting integrated. Um, oriented is basically like your first week and then integrated is more long-term. So again, unlike a traditional internship and a freelancing engagement, there's gonna be a bit more responsibility on you to get up to speed. Um, the clients themselves can be very busy, small, um, and again, the more self-leadership you exhibit, the more successful you'll be. You are basically boarding a moving train and you kind of want to run and like catch it before it pulls out of the station. Um, and your goal in getting oriented is to basically set up the infrastructure so you can basically stay up to speed. So your goals are to have a clear sense of who you are working closely with and be put in touch with them, right? So if you show up and say congrats on hire, your next question is great. Who am I working closely with? Um, and can I chat with them? You want to make sure that you have a home on the team. Make sure you have someone that is responsible for you, that you're reporting to, that you're talking to consistently. Um, I've seen companies, very successful companies, hire so, like social media managers. They get hired and they never connect the social media manager to the marketing team. And the social media manager there is there thinking they're in isolation and then it doesn't work out. Um, and it's the company's fault, but guess who pays the price at the end of the day? that Pangean who got hired and is now out of a job because the company didn't connect them. So it's an injustice, but I don't want you to be that person. I want you to take control and, and, and get yourself into the right team. So make sure you have a home, um, make sure you have a clear sense of whatever the meeting cadence is, have it on your calendar, make sure you know how to attend it, um, have a clear understanding of why the company wanted to hire in the first place. So again, you should know these things already, right? They're part of the interview process, but it's good to rehash them and go into them a little more deeply so you can navigate towards it. Um, and then make sure you're on whatever tools they need. So if they use Slack or Microsoft Teams or have an email, just make sure that like, that's like what the start is. It takes time to make sure that you have the resources and the tools you need. But basically at the end of week zero, you know who you're reporting to, you're meeting with them consistently, you set up a meeting schedule, you have a Zoom link set up and you've gotten all like the onboarding stuff out of the way and you're set up to work. Um, I'm going to breeze through these a little bit quick, more quickly, uh, and then I'll share you the slides at the end. I know we have like 30 more minutes, but I definitely want to get to Q and a, and I know people probably have to hop, um, all about setting expectations consistently, right? So I'm not meeting expectations. The way to meet expectations is to set reasonable ones in the first place. Um, I know that one of the mistakes I made when I was in your shoes was setting really high expectations and like really grand things for what I was going to accomplish and then not meeting them. Because you feel like that initial thing of like, I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z excites people. But what when you don't do them, uh, that's when you aren't meeting expectations and that's when you fall into that danger zone. Show up on time, we went to this already, don't miss meetings, uh, and then be professional and resourceful. So don't swear, be smart, be brief, respect people's times. Uh, these are things I'm sure your career center can help give you guidance on. I'm sure they talk quite a bit about. Um, make sure you're checking in regularly so you don't want to like get hired and like go a month without talking with anyone. So companies move quickly, clients move quickly, stay up to speed, set up like a weekly one on one with whoever you're working with or make sure that you're on the team's kind of recurring meetings. Um, you're going to join an opportunity where you probably don't know how to do everything already, right? I certainly didn't know how to run a company. I was a history major. I didn't know Excel. I didn't know how to code. I didn't know how to design. I didn't know sales. I didn't know marketing. I didn't know any of this, right? But what I was good at was using Google. So figure out what you need to learn and then go and learn it, right? So figure out what tools they use, get a list of them. And almost all these tools have like free lessons, YouTube courses, and just take a couple hours on your own time basically to figure that out because it'll be helpful for you in your journey. One of the best things that we've seen pensions do is just set up coffee chat. So 15 minute Zoom calls with kind of like adjacent team members, the five or six people that maybe are around you and just get to know them, right? It's a great way to integrate yourself, understand the culture, understand the relationships and have people know you and just build awareness of yourself within the larger company. It's a great way to ingrain yourself and make yourself invaluable. Um, ask for feedback. So every time you get paid, make sure that, you know, on Pangea, they can provide you feedback. Make sure they know that. So make sure that they know that they can like give you constructive feedback. It's a great way to improve 
they're, they're going to have feedback, ask for it, ask for them to be honest. Um, document your work, track your time. Uh, I'll show you how to do this on Pangea in a minute here. And then just like communicate and build trust. Trust is the goal in every relationship in life. Um, and trust is built by communicating and doing what you say and hitting your goals. Um, so do what you say, communicate transparently, um, build trust, uh, because that's what is going to give you more independence and more responsibility, more opportunities. And then finally here, um, your goal should be to, you know, grow the relationship over time. So don't just index on your first paycheck index on getting a paycheck every single week for 12 months. Uh, make yourself invaluable to the team, uh, make sure you're moving the needle for the company right towards what they deemed as success and demonstrate that you're reliable and then find and create additional projects right so find opportunities find problems find things the company isn't tackling. And then you can kind of pitch them you don't always have to wait to be given something to do right I think as an intern you kind of like wait to receive tasks and as a page as a freelancer you might receive tasks. But that might not always be the case, right? And guess what? If you're not receiving tasks, you're not going to get hours to work, and therefore you're not getting paid. Um, so make sure you're identifying projects that have an impact, and then ask your client during your weekly check-in that you set up already um, if they'd like you to pursue it. Uh, and guess what? They're, nine times out of ten, they're going to say yes. So making all this easy, uh, what we do at Pangea is we give you access to a whole list of companies and job opportunities that are specifically for students and grads and all these areas, all these companies we pre-vetted, they're all paid, they're all freelance jobs, and they're all looking to work with students and grads. Uh, we give you all of the tools you need to track your time, to track your milestones, to send invoices, to get paid. Uh, we'll send you your tax documents at the end of the year. Uh, we have partnerships with another company that will help you with your tax filings and withholdings and all of that stuff that can be really scary. We help make not so scary. Um, and then we have a dedicated community of fellow college freelancers. So you have access to this awesome feed of other students. So if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you want feedback on your portfolio or profile, uh, you can post on it. It's, it's only students on our team in there. Um, so there, it's a safe place to kind of get feedback uh, with other students and to network with folks from across the country. So in closing, and then we'll, we'll give ourselves 20 minutes or so for, for Q&A, uh, I'm going to give you five things that I wish that I knew when I was 20. Uh, be patient and persistent, right? So good things take time. Pangea has been a long journey. It's taken us five years to build it. We've stayed persistent. Um, so in your own professional journeys, it might not always be so fast. Don't compare yourself to other people. Um, so long as you're improving and navigating towards where you want to be in life, that's all you can ask for. And that's all you should weigh yourself against. So weigh yourself not against anyone else, but where you were yesterday, be patient. Some things take time, but stay on it. Stay persistent. Don't send three proposals and give up. Send at least 20. Uh, learn how to learn. Uh, I learned how to become a data scientist in the last two weeks. I learned SQL, data warehousing, data infrastructure. Those are things that I never knew, uh, but I learned through Google and uh, through online courses. So what you're learning in school right now is how to learn. So that doesn't end when you graduate college. Um, you should be thinking about how you're learning, the strategies you're learning, the help you're getting, and there's always going to be new technologies and there's going to be new things to learn and you want to kind of put yourself on a pathway of always learning and always growing. So don't just learn, learn how to learn and then learn how to be resourceful and ask good questions. Go to Google. Uh, figure out what you want. You might not always know what you want to be in 20 or 30 years from now. Um, and this is a hard question to answer, but try to figure out what you want, even if it's over the next six or 12 months um, and then work backwards. Right. So kind of set an X for yourself. Hey, I want to get some opportunity in X space or X kind of industry and then pick that X and then be patient, persistent and figure out kind of what are the requisite steps to get there. Um, don't focus on what's outside your control. I found myself when I was 20 getting frustrated when companies didn't get back to me, when investors didn't get back to me when uh, this person didn't want to go on a date with me, right? Don't focus on what's outside your control, right? Just focus on who you are as a person and focus on how you react to things, um, how you frame things, and then what you do. Um, you can't control what anyone else does. You can only control what you do, and that's what you should focus on. So don't get upset if other people don't get back to you. Like, that's not going to be a helpful emotion for you. You're going to hold yourself back. Then get back to you. 
improve, talk to someone else, keep going, be patient, be persistent, uh, and take responsibility. I'm not just saying take responsibility when things don't go your way, take responsibility for your life. Because if you don't, someone will take responsibility of it for you. Um, I want all of you to think of yourself as like a CEO. Even if you're not CEO of uh, a business or a tech startup or a freelancer, right? All of you are CEO of your mind, your body, and your souls, right? So it is on you to take control about who you are. Are you feeling good? Are you healthy? Are you working out? Are you getting enough sleep? Are you doing the right things? Are you hanging out with the right people? Like those are all decisions that you can make um, and that you and you alone are responsible for. So if you're not satisfied with your life, if you're not satisfied with who you are or how you feel, um, you and you alone are responsible for that. So take responsibility now and put in place good habits that are gonna help you feel better, do better, and become the person that you want to become. And that, my friends, is uh, the conclusion of my workshop here. Um, my activity is I'm gonna encourage you to take a 90 seconds to make a free profile on Pangea. Uh, and I'm going to drop that link in the chat here and uh, you can now ask me anything. So, and that's also my email. I'll leave this up so that people can, can email me and stuff like that.